I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Pierre-Yves Odier. Um, I'm really glad to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Odier. Uh, he's a research director at INRIA in France and head of the Flowers Project team in INRIA, uh, whose main focus is the models of open-ended development and learning. Uh, he's the pioneer and the world expert in the area of curiosity and intrinsically motivated learning and their real-world applications, including robotics. Um, I'm really happy to see this uh, most recent work uh, presented. Thank you for making this presentation exclusively for this talk. And uh, I guess we are a little bit early, so if you could just give like two more minutes before you start your presentation. I just want to make sure. So it, yes. it seems that I see the messages of people in the waiting room. Uh, am I oh, supposed yes. to admit them or, I or, will... or can someone uh, do this? We will yeah, take care I of it. I can do the admit for you. Okay, good. You don't have to worry about controlling okay. people. <laughs> <laughs> I was not sure whether when you handed on the, the share screen, it, it would also mean uh, <laughs> you hand on the admission. <laughs> you know. Yeah, we've been practicing this Zoom thing for a while <laughs> ourselves. This is pretty tricky, but yeah, we will be able to handle that for you. So this is great. We're really, really on time. <laughs> All right, so we're at on time. So it's all yours. Okay. Hello everyone. Today I'm going to discuss the topic of autotelic deep reinforcement learning agents, and thus probably introducing to you the concept of autotelic. So here it's a topic we've been working uh, for a number of years with my team, and it's about trying to build agents that learn like children, which means able to invent their own objectives and pursue them, uh, organize their own uh, cognitive and sensory motor and social development, which is called autonomous development. And I'm going to illustrate how it requires diverse forms of advanced self-supervision. So first of all, before going into the detail of my talk, I would like to thank many of the PhD students, postdoc engineers, and senior colleagues uh, with whom I've been working over the years. And in particular in this talk, I will illustrate some work where they made central contributions. So first of all, uh, infants are autotelic agents. What does it mean? It means that during exploratory play, which is a major part of the way they learn about the world, they do learn to invent and pursue their own problems. And they do learn to self-generate feedback for the problems and the goals that they imagine for themselves. And so it means that uh, they put into place diverse forms of deep self-supervision. And this kind of self-invention of goals and pursuing of self-invented goals uh, has been studied and shown in many works for several uh, functionalities, ranging for solving problems with scarce rewards, learning the sample efficient manner of world models or discovering open-ended hypothesis. And so as we aim to give uh, machine learning capabilities um, that share those capabilities with children, the challenge has been to reproduce the capacity of children to imagine and to learn to achieve a high diversity of problems and needs. If we look at children, we can imagine very concrete goals, like building a shape with Legos. We can have arbitrary constraints, like body figures in hopscotch. 
They could mix concrete and abstract features, like when aiming to frequently play pirates, where they need to build up a pirate boat and a telescope out of cardboard. And they can invent truly abstract goals, like wanting to write a story about time travel. So the long research, the long-term research program we're working on with my colleagues aims toward machines with the range, this range of capabilities. And so a theoretical perspective that we've been taking is to see the child as a sense-making organism, as a little scientist that makes experiments to acquire good predictive models of the world, and even more importantly, good models enabling to control the world with their actions. And so they make basically experiments by first imagine, imagine a goal, which is often a learning goal. And so it means that on top of the standard learning architecture for discovering regularities, about the world and the world models, there needs to be an adaptive meta architecture that enables them to decide what goals to set at a given point in time and thus what experiments to make and in which order to make those experiments and select those goals. And so it means that they will need to use several forms of self supervision. So, first of all, as uh, they set a goal for themselves when they try to achieve that goal and to learn how to improve toward that goal. They need to generate internally goal achievement errors. So that's the first form of self supervision. And then, uh, uh, when, uh, as they set goals and they observe their goal achievement errors, they are going to monitor the number of internal measures to assess the interestingness of pursuing certain kinds of goals. Uh, and so, this will be some form of self supervision, which is then be given to an internal action selection system. To sample goals in the future that have a higher likeliness to be interesting with respect to these intrinsic measures. And then as they learn to achieve those goals, they will discover regularities about the world, which will enable them to discover and update novel representations for novel kinds of And so how to formalize this form of spontaneous exploration, this form of spontaneous generation of goals and the associated forms of self supervision with machine learning tools. And so, what are the main challenges? So, first of all, one needs some kind of map of the space of goals. We need a, a space for embedding goals. So, the first challenge is how to learn and grow such goal embedding, embedding spaces, especially as new discoveries are made. Then, we need to associate meaning to these goals, in particular, an autonomous agent needs a way to self evaluate how good it is at solving a goal. So this is the goal achievement function, which can be a reference to account for time extended goals. And another challenge is just how to learn such a function. And so conceptually, here a generalized goal is the pair associating a goal embedding and the goal achievement function. And if you had a skill to this specific, if you have a policy to this specification, then you get what we call a skill. Of course, when the agent samples the goal, it will try to learn how to achieve. Uh, this goal with the goal condition policy and use the internal goal achievement function as a self supervised learning stick. And last but not least, uh, how to sample goals, especially in the real world with large spaces, many distractors, easy goals, difficult goals. So, how to estimate the curriculum of learning about these goals? So, a general framework we've been working on to approach these challenges is the IMJ framework. Intrinsically motivated goal exploration processes framework. So it basically refers to all algorithms that look through the following steps. One, observe the context. Two, sample the goal. Three, roll out the corresponding goal condition policy. And four, observe the outcome and update the different kinds of internal models. And so algorithms in this family differ along several dimensions. Some are based on population based techniques such as SAG RIRC and quality diversity algorithms. Others rely on goal condition reinforcement learning, such as RIG or goal GAN. Some use learned goal embedding, such as RIG. Others use hand defined, like curious. Some use learned goal achievement functions, such as imagine. I will describe this. Others use predefined ones, like RIG. And some use goal something policies based on novelty search, like QFIT. And others use learning progress, like curious. So I'd like to discuss how various aspects of these goals have addressed the challenges I listed. So in this first part, I will discuss the importance of goal sampling strategies, and in particular, how an agent can automate its goal sampling and form automatically a learning curriculum. So here we consider hand-defined 
all embeddings and goal achievement function to focus on the something challenge and the automatic curriculum learning challenge. And then I go, I'll go back later on to these other challenges. So what's an interesting learning experiment for the brain? What's an interesting goal? <coughs> Which means what signals to use to self-supervise the goal something first. So many ideas have been proposed in skills ranging from psychology to biology to cognitive modeling and AI or some independent. One idea is that an interesting goal is one which fits to the experience of high novelty or prediction errors or control errors. But well, in the real world, this is not going to work at all. This will lead a robot, for example, to spend its whole day staring through the window, making movements with its arms and trying to predict how the color of cars passing by change as a function of its look. So it's something that uh, we've called uh, now uh, many years ago uh, the white noise problem or the noisy TV problem. But among other ideas, I will now explain one that we've developed and studied a lot initially inspired from the work of Varela and Maturana in biology around the concept of empirical learning progress. And this has both been very robust to, to guide robot learning in the real world and to account for development of trajectories of self in humanity. And so this idea is that the interestingness of a kind of experiment is proportional to empirical change in goal achievement error. This change can be an improvement, but it can also be a decrease in competency, which will enable uh, to drive interest to parts of an environment that change or to skills that are being forgotten. And so we call this idea the learning progress hypothesis. So in practice, it also includes learning regress. So such a mechanism can automatically self-organize exploration along the curriculum. So to visualize how, let's imagine a situation on the top right, um, where a robot is confronted with four kinds of goals characterized by, by different learning rates as we see on, on the top here. And so each pair shows the evolution of the errors in each, each, each type of goal and if the learner will focus on practicing each of them. Then exploration driven by, by this principle will result in avoidance of goals that are too easy or too difficult to learn and first focus on the activity with the fastest learning rates and eventually when it starts to reach a plateau to switch to the second most promising learning situation as we see on the uh, lower right graph here. But so now, uh, here the program is somewhat simplified since activities are pre-segmented and we can view in advance their learning profile. It's of course impossible to assume this for an autonomous agent in the real world. So beyond this general idea, the real difficult question is how to implement it in high dimensional bodies with mechanisms for progressively categorizing transformative activities and estimating online the learning process. And so how do we do this? Let's consider the need with goal achievement experiments. So here in blue, we have the space of goal parameters. Then there is a mechanism for progressively splitting this space into subregions. And in each of these subregions, the learner keeps track of the evolution of goal achievement errors and estimates the absolute value of the derivative of goal achievement errors in each of these regions. And this is what we call the empirical learning process. Then this measure of learning progress is used to decide in which region to sample goal using a, a multi-arm bandit that uses learning progress as the utility. And so here, the bandit we use is typically something like the X3, X3 algorithm because it's a non-stationary bandit problem. And one actually tracks learning progress at different level of the hierarchy, so at different resolutions. But maybe at this point, it's not it's only a detail. Okay, so let's study this idea in the context of a complex environment, such as the ones uh, illustrated on the, on the left with this simulated robot. Uh, so first, uh, in this kind of setup, there can be different types of goals ranging from moving the river to a particular position to moving an object along the target trajectory or producing a sound with a certain frequency with object A. Um, if the robot sample goes by something a random target value with no dimension of all objects, it will entirely fail to learn anything. First of all, because some of the objects can be uncontrollable, like a randomly moving cat in the scene, uh, but also because most random combination of target objects features are impossible. Uh, so for example, trying to move three large objects in the air with one hand. Also a sampling strategy aiming to explore novel or uncertain goals is completely failed because of these forms of distractors. And so to address this, one needs disentangled goal representation, which means the ability to consider goals that are specifying only uh, target configuration or the sub part of the scene. And so one also needs automatic curriculum learning for something goals that are neither too easy nor too difficult. And so this is what we've been studying in the curious system. 
which consider the modular representation of gold with the notion of gold types and gold values. So, for example, here on the gold can typically be moved cube number three to position x, y, while ignoring everything else in the scene. And then gold sampling is made hierarchically using absolute learning progress to sample first gold types and then to sample gold values. Okay, so let's see the good properties of such a gold sampling strategy based on the absolute learning progress. So on the left, we see the curves of competence measures of four gold types. Uh, in the middle, we see curves measuring the absolute value of their derivative, which is the learning progress. Uh, and this is used to decide the probabilities to sample each type of goal as shown on the right. And we first see a form of automatic filtering learning emerging. The easy type uh, in blue is learned path, as we see uh, on, the, on the left, initially leaning to high learning progress, as we see in the middle, until it reaches the plateau. And at this point, the agent automatically shifts to the second easiest but not yet learned goal type, the red one, and so on. But then we see on the green pair that after mastering this goal type and shifting focus on exploring goal type number four, the competence goes down. And this is due here to catastrophic targeting because we are using a neural network that's uh, training on several goals, and this can happen. But because the measure of interestingness is that the absolute value of the learning progress, it includes learning regrets. And thus, we see the agent go back exploring this goal type and end up dealing with the catastrophic targeting problem. Okay, so this is what's happening with uh, models in machine learning, but actually this is forming a hypothesis of the way the uh, human shall also self-organize their uh, learning curriculum and how they select the, the learning program they might work on. And we've tested the theoretical hypothesis recently on a human experiment where we gave uh, human subjects several uh, learning tasks they could freely choose. And here these were classification tasks. They had to learn which could uh, prefer, were preferred by different families of monsters, and in each family, depending, depending on the particular shape of the monster, they prefer certain kinds of food. Uh, and there were easy families to learn, uh, intermediate difficulty families to learn, and families which had random food preferences, impossible to learn. And so we collected uh, uh, the self-organized curriculum generated by uh, uh, several hundred humans, and then we tried to uh, infer the utility function that they were using to organize their learning curriculum. And we were able to show that the utility function that best explains the behavior of human indeed contains uh, components assessing the learning progress. So basically, it was a, a proof that an evidence that humans use learning progress uh, to organize their uh, curriculum of learning when they are free to choose their learning progress. Okay, let's come back to machine learning. And now let's consider how to learn a goal embedding set. So for example, in the case of robots perceiving raw images. So one natural approach has been to train a generative model such as a, a VAE to learn an embedding of images, of, of images and to sample goals in that embedding. And so this was made in RIG with uniform sampling in the prior or with UGL uh, or Stupid, where goals are sampled on the frontier of the known distribution, implementing a form of novel system. The advantage is that it enables much more autonomy as compared to the system before. Yet these systems were not robust to environments with these factors or simply large environments with multiple objects and had a predefined goal achievement function, a simple distance in the VAE and then. So how to go beyond these limits? So to address robustness to these factors and enable more advanced curriculum learning, the green jet system used a learning progress based bandwidth where the arms are unsupervised in learned clusters in the learned embedding, for example, using Gaussian mixture models. And then to address robustness, the presence of multiple objects, the Magal algorithm has been used uh, based on uh, training beta VAs to learn disentangled embeddings and then clustering of groups of dimensions of Latin dimension corresponding to different objects, and then learning progress based sampling of goals that characterize individual objects. And then to address the issue of learning the goal achievement function, one idea explored by a series of papers has been to learn the action distance. So a challenge uh, with using a predefined function like uh, L2 distance in the VAE embedding is that similar images are not always a good sign that an image goal is close to be reached. And so it can be a deceptive reward. So a better measure that can be learned through exploration is to predict the average number of actions that need to be taken to reach a goal. But yet, one limit of this approach is that it does not generalize easily to out of distribution goals. It should be the most, the most interesting kind. 
And so let me go now uh, to part three of my talk, so language as a tool for imagining and something abstract and out of distribution group to address the limits of those previous approaches. And so in the approaches I've described so far, spaces in which agents could compose borders corresponding to very concrete goals, such as producing a precise movement or a visual pattern. Furthermore, when using generative models to sample goals like VAs, even in the case of incentive towards novel goals, the same thing happened within the distribution of known goals. But to power a creative exploration, however, agents will need to generate novel, creative, and abstract goals, goals that are out of distribution of things already seen. And in this process, children use language as a creative tool. So Pierre Schiffer discovered that children use egocentric, egocentric speech to narrate their ongoing activities. And later, Vygotsky showed that they used it to generate goals and plan and plans to solve them. And language is indeed uh, compositional by nature. It can push the limits of the known towards the unknown, as Chomsky illustrated uh, with the extravagant construction, colorless green ideas, curiosity. So the compositionality of language can thus be used to generate out of distribution goals to imagine new goals from known ones. So for example, if I know what a cat and a bus are, then I can easily compose a tool to generate a new concept, the cat bus, and I can easily picture what it would look like in my mind. So inspired by this, we recently introduced the Imaging System, which is an intrinsically motivated learning architecture that leverages natural language interactions with a social partner to explore procedurally generated scenes and interact with others. And so in the first space here on the left, Imaging discovers meaningful environment interactions through its own exploration and gets descriptions provided by a social partner. And as it discovers quotation goals, the agent learns to represent them by jumpy training a language encoder, mapping language to goal embedding, and the language condition of reward function. And then in the second phase, the agent starts imagining goals by composing known ones. You can now train autonomous, autonomous and goals via the language condition reward function learned in the first step. So let's see this in more detail. Here we have an environment that is procedurally, procedurally generated at each episode with many types of objects. That are in color, in shapes, and, by, and have various types of compositional dynamics. It's a bit like Minecraft, but maybe a bit less uh, nice visually, but still quite composition. But for example, animals can be grown if one brings them through the water, but plants can only be grown with water. So an agent initially tries random things, and there is a social peer providing linguistic description of what he did in an episode. And so the agent is going to learn the meaning of these descriptions and reuse them as its own goals in the next episode. And so here, in line with the IMJF framework, the meaning of sentences will be learned and encoded in two ways. First, the agent will learn the goal achievement function conditioned by learned embedding of goal sentences. And so the signals for training this goal achievement function come from the social team. And then the goal achievement function is used by the agent internally to self supervise the training of policies from the general language goal. And so, in addition, the learned goal achievement function is also very useful to achieve hindsight learning for relabeling behavioral trajectories with the language goal they achieve. Because indeed, the social team does not always provide full description of what was there. So it's useful to complete the description given by the social team. And so now comes the most interesting part. After the first phase, there is now an autonomous exploration phase in which the social peer does not speak anymore. So here the agent continues to sample goals as sentences already uttered by the social peer and training on them. But most importantly, the agent also invents new out of distribution goals by recombining words to form new sentences, modeling their meaning using the Uh, sorry, Dr. De Yer, your sound. Oh, okay. you what I get wrong, there are two big challenges. First, how to imagine new sentences that are sufficient for the ability to be meaningful or at least useful to make some discovery. So we here leverage the construction grammar framework used to model child language development with pattern imitation and discovery of world equivalent classes, and it's illustrated by the colors on the left. And the second challenge is how can the goal achievement function generalize to out of distribution? This is absolutely key because the generalization, generalization of the goal achievement function will enable the agent to self supervise and train the policy. And so, to enable such generalization ability, we use the neural architecture that combines three things 
The first thing is affordance based representation, basically inputs input states of the body and object and their change in an episode. The second ingredient is attention to filter information of sentences and irrelevant to the language goal. And finally, deep sets, which combined with affordance based representation, constitute a variation of the relation network, which is itself a special kind of graph neural network. And so to evaluate such mechanisms for out of the solution language goal imagination and the associated modular neural architectures, we basically made a, a series of experiments to link the capacity of the agent to achieve test goals from a test set of sentences that were never uttered by the social system. So we've also compared the properties of various goal imagination techniques, showing the robustness of the approach to many kinds of goal imagination, even some that are not very um, uh, advanced, quite quite dumb goal imagination approach are still very useful, uh, enabling the, the agent to self train and self supervise uh, to generalize the new sentences without the presence of the social team. We have also studied in detail the, how it can boost differentially various kinds of linguistic generalization. So you can see the details in the, in the, in the paper which we have mirrored last year. And centrally, we've also uh, used metrics of exploration showing how this form of goal imagination enables creative discovery. And we finally, some fun qualitative analysis like seeing an agent imagine the goal of growing a plant that is a goal never uttered by the social team. And then first trying to do it by giving food to the plant because its quality generalizes the strategy for growing animals. But then the learned goal achievement function sees it does not work and self supervises uh, to adapt to the right behavior, which is bringing water um, to the plant. Okay, so takeaway. So uh, I spoke of many things, but maybe what you shall uh, keep in mind. Um, from this talk is first of all the concept of autotelic deep reinforcement learning agents, which means that first of all, agents not only uh, sample their own goal, but they learn to represent and they learn to invent out of distribution goals to pursue. Then they self supervise uh, intrinsic rewards that measure interesting left of the goal they pursue to decide whether they continue each goals to samples and forming automatic curriculum learning. And they also learn to generate their own feedback for achieving these goals, potentially initially by interacting with the social team using language and then internalizing language to self supervise. And then we, I've shown that IM gets is a very useful algorithmic framework to develop and study autotelic agents. And finally, I emphasize again the role of language as a tool to imagine abstract out of distribution goals with learned goal embedding and goal achievement function and which I believe is paving the way towards open-ended creative exploration and even more generally to uh, a family of agents which are both, both autotelic and also Vygotskyan in the sense that like Vygotsky proposed in cognitive sciences, uh, like children, they are uh, autonomously exploring the world by uh, using cognitive tools that were initially acquired for social interaction, uh, such as language. Thank you very much. Uh, and let's hope for uh, stimulating this discussion. Well, Thank you. So I'm, I'm ready for the questions. Thank you. Um, maybe I could use the host privilege to ask the first question. <laughs> so uh, I actually wrote on the chat. So. Um, during your uh, description of the automated curriculum learning, uh, you describe that interest as an absolute value of the learning derivative, which means if you are learning fast, then like the interest is high. But also if you're like forgetting or you're losing capability fast, then you're also like having the interest high. What does that mean in your list of, uh, you had like a long list of like uh, development, uh, biology, psychology, cognitive science and machine, um, machine learning list of uh, goal setting. What does that mean? And okay. secondly, should yeah. we worry <laughs> about such association? Um, so I guess there are multiple ways to answer your question. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe a first way uh, to answer the question is that um, it's been uh, proposed or speculated by a number of psychologists 
uh, that what's most interesting to explore for the brain are activities of intermediate, intermediate complexity uh, or optimal challenge. Uh, this was proposed by people like Berlin a long time ago and more recently by people like Chick and Mihai. Uh, but then if you want to model that precisely, it's not so easy what, I mean, when you speak about intermediate complexity or intermediate challenge, I mean, you need to have some kind of range of what's the mean, what's the max, and so how do you, what's intermediate? Um, and so one way actually to model uh, the intuition that was proposed uh, by the psychologists is actually to use the concept of learning progress. Uh, because in a way, uh, if an agent explore in priority uh, situations where there is highest learning progress, these are situations which are neither too easy, because if it's too easy, there is no learning progress, nor too difficult. If it's too difficult and whatever you practice, you don't make any progress. That, that's, that's, that's really like uh, far away. And so if you maximize learning progress, then in practice, you're actually um, practicing intermediate complexity activities, but you never have to define the notion of intermediateness because you maximize something. And that from a mathematical point of view, in a way that's much easier. And I'd say it's also probably much easier for a biological uh, organism to implement this. But I would say that this is a first relationship. So there is another relationship, which is, okay, what are the interesting consequences of uh, using this, uh, this measure? And as I was mentioning, one interesting consequence is that it is uh, provoking a self-organization of developmental phases of increasing complexity. And in some other work, which I did not discuss today, where, for example, we, we, we uh, use this um, uh, idea to model the way vocal uh, development happens or tool use development happens, we could show that the emergent developmental phases that we observe, they share very uh, strong structural similarities with the developmental traje trajectories of infants. Uh, and, and at the same time, share diversity like the infants. So in fact, there is something a bit of a mystery if you look at infant developmental trajectories, is that at, at the populational level, at, there are certain uh, structural properties that, that are very recurrent, that come very often. But then each particular child has its own peculiar trajectory. And sometimes you have children which have very different trajectories. So there is both regularities and diversity. And this actually is emerging spontaneously by running multiple times exploration driven by learning progress. Um, so I, I guess these, these are already two links with, with psychology and cognitive sciences. Um, probably I could discuss more, but maybe we can, I, we can uh, let time for other questions. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. So we have like list of questions. Are you able to see the chat or maybe yeah, I could? Yeah, yeah. Let's me see. Let me see. Um, okay. Uh, okay. I see someone wants to like the, the slide. Yes, I can. Uh, I can send a, a link to the slide on the on the chat afterwards. Um, I can even send send a link to the the video if you want. Um, uh, a bit of a practical question. Uh, okay, yeah. So um, uh, a question about evaluating learning progress. Do you have to evaluate progress on each goal or can it be estimated more efficiently? So indeed, okay. So something maybe I did not explain in details is that what's indeed what's completely key uh, is that um, to be efficient, the system needs kind of to, pre to be able to predict what's going to be lo the learning progress associated to goals it could imagine. And so in a way, uh, uh, there is a meta regression or a meta learning problem here where uh, not only he learns to achieve a goal, but he learns to predict what, uh, what's, what's going to be the learning dynamics about a given goal. And the way it's doing this is actually like in a way like traditional machine learning is practicing goals and goals uh, are defined by vectors in an embedding space. Uh, and when he's practicing a goal with a little budget of time, he can measure locally how much it makes progress and then in certain region of the, of the space of parameters of goals, it's going to make a regression model of uh, what's the relation between the parameters of the goal and the progress. And that's the way it's going to predict uh, the expected learning progress of a new goal is not attempted so far. And indeed, if we're not doing this, that, that's not efficient. So we need to do this kind of thing to make the whole architecture efficient. Okay, so I see another question. Uh, in the language to goal framework, symbol grounding is provided by external description of the agent behavior. It seems expensive. How can we develop others of, of data to ground language? Um, well, I don't know, expensive relative to what? I mean, like, um, 
if you look at, at children, children, they, they, learn, they learn language by interacting with social peers. And in a way, this is expensive, but uh, this is expensive in time. But if in, in number of interactions, it, they are pretty much, they are pretty efficient in a way, because like uh, they have thousands of, of interactions, but they don't have billions of interactions, uh, such as what needed by uh, deep reinforcement learning systems uh, for solving much simpler problems. But yet, this is a relative, a good question. And what could be made uh, if the goal is engineering and not to model the way children are learning, what could be made is to leverage, for example, very, very large pre-trained language models. For example, we've heard recently of models like T5 or GPT-3. Um, and, um, uh, and among those models, some of them are multimodal. For example, you have things like DALI or CLIP from OpenAI, uh, which have been trained by uh, uh, um, uh, databases where text is aligned with, with images. Um, and then those, those pre-trained models could be actually used to generate hypotheses uh, um, uh, that the, uh, an autonomous embodied agent could try in the real world. Like, still, he has to try them to, in a way, to ground them really, to test them, to verify them. But, but maybe those, those pre trained models might be used to guide exploration and the generation of hypotheses to, to, like, to avoid doing things that are completely uh, uh, irrelevant. So, that, that's one way I would see the things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is, he, is that uh answer for you? Yeah, that was a very helpful answer. Uh, I like the distinction between expensive in terms of number of samples and expensive in time. Um, it's a good way to think about it. Excellent. Well, so uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Odier. Uh, this is actually the uh, end of time. So uh, thank I you really very much thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh,